Well, I don't know about you, but um, as every summer goes by and it kind of gets to the end of the summer, I always think back and, man, I, I always, even though I, 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 you know, we do stuff during the summer and everything, I always have one little point of regret, and that's at the end of the summer, is that I didn't travel as much as I really wanted to, because I love to travel in, in, in one sense. I, lo- I, I love to see different places in the world and things like that, and I'd, I'd love to get there. But, you know, there's, a, there's, there's one thing holding me back. Besides the obvious obstacles of time and money, you know, <laughs> that, that we all have that keeps us from traveling. But there's one other big thing that holds me back from traveling like I may want to. And that is, I hate flying. How many people hate flying? I just despise it. And it's not that I'm, a, I'm afraid of flying. It's not that, you know, I don't think the plane's going to fall out of the sky or anything like that. I'm not sitting there worried about that even though that, you know, I'm not real fond of heights or anything, but I'm, I'm not scared of it dropping out of the sky. Now, my issue with flying is that of room. I can't stand to be cooped up and cramped up on those stinking overcrowded tin cans for hours at a time. I mean, you have to be contortionist sometimes to sit in the spaces they have, and I'm claustrophobic. So basically, you know why other people on the plane, they're having casual conversations with each other, or they're sleeping, they're doing something. I'm in agony. I'm just sitting there going, oh, just, is it done? You know, and I'm looking at my watch, and it's been like five minutes, and I'm just like, we got three more hours of this or something. So I just can't stand it. I mean, if I could move around a little bit or do something, put my feet, I, but usually I can't, so I'm stuck, and there's no wiggle room. And it's one of the most frustrating and uncomfortable experiences I can think of for my own life. So that's why I don't like traveling. But have you ever felt trapped like that? Maybe it's not on a plane. Maybe it's just in life. Maybe you have situations you're facing in life, and you kind of feel trapped, like there's no wiggle room, like you can't seem to move in any direction without getting into trouble. So you feel like you're just stuck and you have no wiggle room in your life. Well, we're going to touch on this this morning. Actually, Paul touches on this as we return to our journey through Romans. This morning, we're in Romans chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, please open up to Romans chapter 2. We're going to start in like verse 17. But what we have is Paul in chapter 2, he's continuing to set this stage for sharing the good news, the gospel. If you remember, uh, Paul's readers, who, who are us, because we're reading it, so it's written for us, but it's also written to his readers in the day, which are the churches in Rome, the members of the churches in Rome. And those churches that he's writing to, they're trying to share Jesus in the face of intense persecution and just increasing evil in their world. But also, there's other issues going on in the churches in that there's internal tension because the churches are, are made up of both Jewish believers and Gentile believers or non-Jewish believers, and they all have different cultures and different backgrounds and everything, and they're starting to not quite mesh. And it's starting to kind of tear apart. So they're struggling to find this unity. So Paul knows... And he shares, he says, you know what? There's one thing that's going to bring us together. And there's one thing that's going to make an impact on an ever worsening world. And that one thing is the gospel. So Romans is all about the gospel. However, before tackling the good news of the gospel, Paul spends a lot of time in the beginning of Romans talking about bad news, really bad news. And that's what we've been talking about. And here's what basically is Paul saying, is sin is a lot worse than we can ever imagine. So we've been learning about sin the last couple weeks. In fact, chapter 1, we looked at at, um, unchecked sin. And we looked at this truth about sin, that sin always gets worse if it's not dealt with. Always. And Paul talked about how it just gets more horrific and, and widespread, infecting everybody. However, many of those sins he mentioned in chapter 1, and especially in the culture at the time, were sins that the Gentiles struggled with, but the Jews not really. And when he's talking to the Jews, we can kind of put ourselves in that of religious people, you know, in our world today. So the Jews might not have struggled as much with them, so they may be tempted to look at all those sins and say, well, yeah, that's their problem, see, but we feel a little superior because we don't really struggle with them. 
and they might get tempted to start to judge and become judgmental. So that's why in chapter 2, Paul tackles some more bad news in addressing the Jewish believers where he says, you know what, you have no room to judge. In fact, here's the truth about sin. Not that bad is still bad. And that's what we talked about last week. We can try to minimize it, but there's no minimizing sin. All sin is just as bad, so you have no room to talk. In fact, he said, just because, you know, you as Jews, you have the law, doesn't make you any better off than anybody else if you're not obeying it, if you're not living by it. And all of this talk about sin, what, what Paul, in essence, is doing, he's cl closing in the walls around his readers, and hopefully around us, that we can't get away from sin. We can't get away from saying, you know what, we have a sin problem. So he's kind of closing in these walls of people that say, well, maybe I'm not that sinful, or maybe, I'm, you know, maybe I still can be good enough to find righteousness with God in my own efforts. And Paul keeps chipping away at that so that more and more they realize that in and of ourselves we have no hope. And that's where Paul continues now this morning as he continues to give more bad news and his indictment against sin grows. And what he shares today is that when it comes to our sin, there is no wiggle room with God. Do you know that? When it comes to our sin, there's no wiggle room when it comes to God. So here's how he shuts down any possibility for self-righteousness. So we're going to read through and we're going to stop along the way and try to um, make some sense out of what he's saying. So we're starting verse 17. So here's what Paul continues to say about sin. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you're sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourselves? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who are a bore, hate idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For it's written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So here's what Paul's doing here. He's addressing the Jews or the religious ones, the ones that are relying on their self-righteousness. So we can kind of put people that have grown up, you know, in a Christian home and all have a, have a heritage, a Christian heritage. And he's addressing them. He's speaking to anyone, you know, including who, who basically feel that you're, that we're, they're better than others, you know, and they say, well, we have this heritage and we do a lot of religious stuff. So we're pretty good. We're not that bad. Well, you want to know something? There's nothing more dangerous than a sinner who believes they're righteous. And that's what Paul's exposing here. So Paul addresses what may be keeping these readers that he's talking to, what may be making them feel this way and keeping them from understanding their sin and their need for salvation. And he begins by addressing those that feel entitled to righteousness because of their good actions that they do, or because of the good, th good things they do. And he starts listing some, doesn't he? I mean, he talks about knowing and approving God's will. You know, um, he starts out by saying, you boast in your relationship with God. And that's not a bad thing. We should boast in our relationship with God. Wow, we know God and God knows us. That's a good thing. And he lists a, a lot of other actions that really in and of themselves, they're good. They're good to do, right? Knowing and prove God's will. Um, we get good instructions. We, we become a guide to the blind. You know, we're reaching out. We're instructing others. We're, we're teaching our children right. We're being filled with knowledge and truth. And th those are all pretty good things. Yet Paul brings the hammer down. After he lists all those good things, they might be saying, well, we do them, we do them. And then he says, but you who teach, do you teach yourselves? Right? You who have all this knowledge, are you living it? Are you doing it? Because if you're not doing it, you know what? You're a fraud. 
and everybody knows it. That's what he's talking about, the name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles. Is that, you know what? When we try to live by our perfection, and we can't, everybody knows we're a fake. And he's saying, you may think you're doing all this, but unless you're living absolutely perfectly, you're a terrible testimony to your world. I mean, we see this today, don't we? Where some Christians, they sit on some moral high ground all the time, looking down at everybody's like, and then when they fall, what happens? Everybody says, see, there's nothing to this Christianity. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. They're, they're, and that's what Paul's basically saying. You know what? You say you're all that, but you can't be. You're not. And then he continues. He continues, not only have you done these actions, but what about things that you do, these, these rituals that you do? And he says in verse 25, he says, for circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. Remember, the Jews will get circumcised. It was a sign of the covenant with God or a sign that they belong to God. And if, is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who's uncircumcised, uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have been the written code of circumcision but break the law. What he's saying here, you do these Christian rituals that want to mark yourself as belonging to God or righteous. Yet if you're not righteous, then you're mocking these rituals that you're doing. They, they mean nothing. And the person that might not have gone through these rituals, but they're following Jesus, they're better off than you are. And you're trying to look down on them. Now, we look at circumcision and we say, well, what's that? We can put in our day and age other rituals like baptism or communion. These are all, they're outward acts that we do that are supposed to signify something that's already happened inside of us. Right? That's all they are. And that's what circumcision is. It was an outward act that was a sign of something that's supposed to be happening inward or to have happened. So if you're not living that, it's just like with baptism. If you get baptized and nothing's really changed in you, that that's an outward symbol for it, then you're just getting all wet. You're wasting your time. And that's what he's saying. So you put all this onus and self-righteousness in, in all these things you're doing, like going to church and getting baptized, and you want to do all that. But if you're not living it and you're not righteous, then it's a fraud. Don't you get that? And he says, so... And, and Paul says, you know why it means nothing? Here's why. Verse 28, he says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But the Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise, or the man who's made righteous from his heart, is not from man, but from God. Paul's saying, it's not the ritual that makes us righteous, but it's what's happened inside of us. It's what man can't see, and it's what man can't change for that matter. Our heart. Right? Paul says the spirit of God alone changes the heart, and that's what God's pleased with. God's pleased with a heart after him, not a bunch of actions. So what Paul's saying, to kind of sum that all up, is that being a Jew doesn't make a person right with God. Coming from a Christian heritage or a Christian home doesn't make someone right with God. Knowing and teaching the law, doing religious rituals, none of it can make a person right with God. Just as growing up in a Christian family, going to Christian school, memorizing a bunch of verses, getting baptized, going to church every week can make us right with God. It can't save us just, as, just the same as being a good Jew can't save. But Paul continues into verse 3. I mean, chapter 3. Now he continues saying, so now they're kind of getting mad, right? His audience is probably like, what are you saying? So they're going to start to raise objections. So he starts dealing with some objections that may come up. In verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, So if a Jew can't, a good, being a Jew can't save, then what advantage has the Jew? What good is it to be a Jew? Or what value is of circumcision. 
So Paul's shifting the argument here from the actions of the Jew to objections that may raise. And in literary terms, what Paul's doing here in his argument is something called a diatribe. You're going to learn another big word today, right? Diatribe. Diatribe does not mean a group of people living together wanting to lose weight. That's not what a diatribe is. A diatribe is this, okay? It's, it's presenting answers to perceived questions that, may, that could be asked. So Paul's saying, so I guess right now you're thinking this. Well, I'll answer this. Before you can even ask it, I'll answer it. Okay? So that's what Paul then starts to do here in chapter 3. So he says, so you're probably getting pretty mad right now. And you're saying, what good is it to be a Jew? Now, with everything Paul's been saying, Paul, you, you would expect Paul to say, it doesn't give you any good to be a Jew with God, right? But he doesn't do that. He throws a curveball. Okay, he says, no, it's good to be a Jew. There's no rigor room in their actions and heritage. You know, maybe they can squeeze away to God through their intellect. But, but if being a Jew can't save them, what advantages of being a Jew? You see, Paul's a Jew. So if they're asking that question, they're going to say, well, Paul, you're not saying you're worthless, are you? I mean, you, you, you can't possibly mean that. And you'd expect Paul to say, well, no, there's no advantage. But he throws a curve and he says, no, it's a huge advantage to be a Jew. And here's what the huge advantage in being a Jew is. Is that we are given the oracles of God. Here's the way he says it. Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Do you know what the oracles of God is? It's the word of God. The Jews were instructed with scripture. And he's talking about the law and the Old Testament. This is the advantage the Jews had on the Gentiles. They have a history with God and a history of hearing from God. So they more than anybody else would know the reality of sin and the stain of sin and the, and the curse of sin. They would also know more than anybody the need for a savior and be able to see how God traced that, the coming of this Messiah that he would send. So what Paul is saying, oh no, you guys have more advantages than anybody else. So you should even know better. So he's actually indicting them even worse. Because he's saying, well, you, no, you have all this at your disposal. It's kind of like with us, with being in the church. Hey, we have God's word. We have worship. We have all of this before us. And if we're not living it, man, we're really bad off. Because we should know better. And that's what Paul's saying. You should definitely know better. So that objection, it doesn't hold any water. So he brings up another objection. Verse 3, he says, well, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithful? Uh, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? And here's this objection. They're basically he's basically saying, well, you might ask then if God if we're God's people and God says he's going to be faithful to his people, if some of his people are unfaithful, doesn't that mean God basically failed? Right. So they're trying to use logic here, and they're saying you don't make any sense with this because this would make sense if God's all, all this powerful, then how come he can't control people? And Paul says, as the answer to that, verse 4, by no means let God be true and everyone were a liar as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you're judged. So he's basically saying, no way. God can't be blamed for sin. God can't be blamed for unfaithfulness just because he allows it. Actually, God shows his faithfulness all the more in the midst of unfaithfulness because he provides a way out through Jesus. That's where he's saying so that we can prevail when we're judged. So, so God, even in the midst of unfaithfulness, is showing himself more faithful. His faithfulness shines because of unfaithfulness. So, there's another objection that comes up. All right, so if that's the case... If our unrighteousness ser serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say then? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. Here's what they're saying. So, if us being unrighteous shows the righteousness of God, then why should God punish us? It's not our fault. That's not fair. And he's saying this is, inhuman. This is how humans would think. Right? You would sit there and say, well, that's not fair. If you're saying this is a good thing 
because God shows himself good, then why am I getting punished as, as if it's a bad thing? And Paul says, you're crazy. Actually, he says, by no means. For then, how could God judge the world? He says, well, if that's the case, then God can't judge anybody. And you've already said that sin is sin, and all these bad sins, yeah, people should get judged for that. So either God judges all sin, or he judges none of it. Okay? So they have one more objection up their sleeve. And one other objection about sin, as we try to wiggle, find a loophole where we can kind of say, well, no, I'm okay in and of myself. And he says, but if through my lie, God's dr truth abounds to his glory, verse 7, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us saying, with saying, their condemnation is their just. Or saying, well, if the end result of all of my evil is that God can do more good, shouldn't I do more evil so God can do even more good? In fact, he gives an argument like this later on where he asks another, he's doing another diatribe and he says, should I keep on sinning so grace may abound all the more? And he says, by no means. And that's basically what he's saying here. You're crazy. That's just the crazy argument right there. And in fact, he even says, your condemnation is just. That's why you're being condemned. Because of dumb statements like that. That you're trying to, you're trying to say that's a good thing. Listen to yourself. So all of this, basically, Paul is saying in our passages this morning that we're looking at. And in a nutshell, he says, when it comes to our sin, there is no wiggle room with God. Yes, sin's bad. In fact, being not that bad is still bad. And when it comes to sin, there's no wiggle room. There's no gray area. There's no white sin, little white lies and big sins. There's, a, there's none of that. There's no wiggle room. If we're sinners, we're sinners. And we can't save ourselves, period. And this is what he's talking about. Sin is big. It's a universal problem. It occurs God's wrath and his judgment and his punishment. Gentiles, Jews, non-religious people, those who grew up in the church are all trapped in sin. And it's a bad problem. And it's a problem that we can't fix. It's pretty heavy, isn't it? Paul's getting heavy. Now, I told you, be patient. You know, he's hammering sin and he's hammering all this bad news. But good news is coming. Just realize that. A couple weeks, good news is coming. Trust me. But the reality is that when it comes to sin as human beings, and this is why... Paul is hammering sin so much. And you say, he keeps harping on sin. I get it. No, we don't. Do you know why? Because as human beings, you know what our default is when it comes to sin? We'll find any loophole to make us feel not quite so bad. That's why when we're in sin, instead of just saying I was wrong, we look at somebody else and we say, but they were more wrong. You see, that's our default, isn't it? Our default is to deny, deflect, or minimize sin. So we'll look for any kind of wiggle room we can find. So what Paul's doing with hammering sin so much is he's, he's trying to get through to them. Don't even think for a moment that you're not lost. That you can save yourself. Don't even think for a moment. So in our passage this morning, basically what Paul is detailing is why we can't wiggle out of our sin problem. So real quickly, as we kind of close up, I want to share with you kind of his, his train of thought here of why he's telling us or how he's telling us, you know, you, you know why you can't wiggle out of this sin problem? There's some very important reasons of this. And I just shared them. And he goes, you know what? I mean, we, we can't wiggle out of our sin problem because we can't even follow our own standards. Do you know that? We think we can wiggle out of our sin problem. Well, even when we put standards, we can't obey them. When we say, well, this is what makes somebody righteous, and we can't even do it perfectly. Right? He begins talking about that with the heritage and how they boast in all those good things and they're proud. And, and what they think makes them righteous. You know, knowing the right stuff, teaching, keeping, keeping rituals, 
you know, those things that look really good. Yet, as Paul points out, even if these were how to become righteous, he says, we can't even do this. <laughs> In teaching, do we teach ourselves? In teaching someone not to steal, do we steal? Do we do this? Are we perfect? We're putting these standards and say, well, this is what I need to keep. And we can't even do it ourselves. And what that is, it's self-righteous arrogance that does that. To think we cannot overcome evil through our own effort. We see it in our world today. We see it in the way we make laws, don't we? We, we see evil, so we say, let's make more laws. Let's make more laws to restrict people. Because if we make enough, then it'll make sure people act right. There's debate going on today in Congress about that. Here's the problem. Those that are evil don't obey laws. We can have all the laws in the world. But if evil still exists, it's going to find a way. Because the problem isn't more laws or more rules or more standards. The problem is evil. And we can be just as misguided in our spiritual lives with this as we hold other people to a standard that we can't even keep. And we start judging other people for things and we can't even do it. Because the problem is in us. It's not outward things that we can set ourselves up that we can be right. You know, one day while Jesus was teaching the crowds, this young successful guy comes up to him and he asks him, he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Basically he's saying, what self-effort can I do to be righteous? So Jesus tells him. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to obey the law. Which ones? He says, you know, the Ten Commandments. And here's what he says. It's in Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus, where this is talked about. And it says, the young man said to Jesus after he told him this, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? I've done all these things. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, well, okay, if you would be perfect, go sell all you possess and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You see, what Jesus was telling this guy is that if he was truly committed, there would be nothing he wouldn't do. Yet the man showed that, well, money was more important than God. So he says, well, the standard is the Ten Commandments. He didn't even get past commandment number one. You talk about not living up to our own standards. Even in our best efforts, we can't even get past the first one. I have no other gods before me. Because <laughs> he says, well, money's my God. And sadly, this is the result when we rely on our self-righteousness as well. We're going to fail. Then Paul, he says, not only this, not only can't we keep our own standard, but we can't wiggle out of our sin problem because we also can't change what's most important. We're unable to change what's most important. We're unable to fix what's really broken. And being set apart as God's. God's people. Outward obedience is not what makes the difference. Doing a bunch of good stuff. Outward holiness. It may look impressive to other people. And people may say, wow, they're really good. But it's nothing in overcoming sin. It's just actions. It's fake. It's empty. What's important is that which others can't see, Paul says, and that which we can't change. Our heart. Paul says the heart is changed by the Spirit of God in us. Only God can change your heart. You know, this, that, that isn't new. Paul didn't just make it up. The prophet Ezekiel touches upon this. You know, and he, he's, he hears from God. God speaks to him about where real change happens. And here's what God says to the prophet Ezekiel. And this is an awesome, awesome passage. Ezekiel 36, he says, God says to him, You know, Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit 
I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Did you catch that? Outward change comes from the inward work of God in us. And when God changes our heart, we will obey him. The outward stuff will happen. Remember we talked about the clean, the clean and unclean cup, the outside of the cup. First clean the, outside, the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean. This is what Jesus is kind of referring to. What God's saying to Ezekiel. God will put a new heart in us and put his spirit in us so that we can follow him. So that we can live outward. Only God can change our heart. Our outward actions mean nothing unless God changes our heart first. There's no wiggle room there. And then finally, Paul shares one more reason why we shouldn't, why we have no wiggle room. There's no loopholes in dealing with sin apart from God. And in this, he responds to these objections, right? That are being made and saying, you're unable to save yourselves. And what we find at the core of Paul answering these objections and at the core of the self-righteous person is a fatal flaw. You see, when we rely on ourselves, we can't see God as greater than ourselves. You know why there's no wiggle room? Because in and of ourselves, we'll never see God as greater than ourselves and he's our only hope. But yet, we'll still always want to be God. We can't see he is the answer. We'll try every other way. The truth is, one that is one that keeps so many from salvation is this truth. We want to be our own God. We want to see ourselves just as great as God. That's what the rich young ruler did when he's talking to Jesus. He's saying, hey, I can do this. I don't need God. Just tell me what I can do. Why did he miss out? Because he was trusting in himself. He was making himself the savior. He was making himself God. And we can do our, this ourselves. Even when we, we might not think it, we said, I would never do that. Well, yeah, we can. Here's how we do it ourselves. When we deny the seriousness of our own sin, we say, yeah, that was bad, but it wasn't that bad. It was, they were worse. Or when we compare ourselves to others as the standard of what matters. And we say, well, since I'm better than them, so I'm okay. Or maybe we pick and choose what sins are the big stuff and usually things we don't do. And then we say, what, the small stuff, that's okay. That, that gets us by. And we do this, don't we? We do it every day. And you know what we're doing? We're making it so we can't see that God is greater than ourselves. And God is the answer. We do this most of all when we do this. When we think that God works according to our logic and our ways. God works like one of us. And we do this all the time, right? Well, God would never do that. I mean, I wouldn't do it, so why would God do that? It would be wrong for me. Why would it be? And that's what all these arguments, all these objections are about. Well, this makes sense on human terms, so that can't be. The problem is God isn't human. God is the creator of the universe, so he can make things work that don't seem like they make sense to us. He makes work. And Paul touches on this later in Romans, in Romans 11, and we'll talk about this later on. But he says this, oh, the depths of the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable are his ways. He's not like us. Four, who has ever known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has ever given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Yet, how many times do we try to take the role of God and we want to counsel God? Have you ever prayed and you say, all right, God, here's how you need to work. You know, here's, here's what we need to do. Let's put our heads together and I need this job. So you need to work in this way. Did you ever become God's counselor? Because we think, well, this is how it works. It's, it's a deal. Or, you know, if I do stuff for you, you know, I do you a solid, God, you're going to do me a solid, right? I mean, I'm going to pray every morning. 
that's a good thing, right? I'm going to pray. Or I got, I got a cross-country meet. I'm going to pray before my cross-country meet, so that means I'm going to run good because you're going to make me run good because I just did you something good. I did you a favor. And that's what Paul's saying. You, you ever, who's, who's ever given to God that God should repay you? What are you talking about? That's not how God works. God's not sitting there, oh, you did that? Oh, I'm indebted to you. No, he's not. God doesn't work like we work. God is not human. He's higher than us. And he alone can make things that don't seem to make sense work. Like this. How we can sin against him and we have an offense against him, yet he takes it upon himself to pay the penalty for our offense himself. That makes no sense in human terms, does it? Yet it makes all the sense in the world for God. Who would do that? God would. Because he's so much greater than us. You see, when it comes to our sin, there is no wiggle room with God. We can't be made righteous or overcome sin ourselves. We are doomed without a Savior. Our good deeds, our right knowledge, our heritage, our traditions hold no power to do anything about removing our sin or making us right with God. Yay! Does this make you feel happy? Isn't this uplifting? No. It's a bummer, isn't it? It should be making us feel really uncomfortable and saying, well, what am I supposed to do now? Ha! Ah, now you're almost ready for the good news. See what Paul's doing here? You're getting ready to hear this good news, and this good news is going to be the greatest news you ever heard because now you're in the position to hear it. And Paul is getting ready to share the good news. You see, we may be powerless, but God is all-powerful. He overcomes sin for us, and he alone can change our heart. Best of all, he loves us so much that he wants us to experience this despite all of our unfaithfulness. He wants to free us from being trapped and having no wiggle room. He wants to free us in Jesus. He wants to give us space to do more than just wiggle. He wants to give us space so we can soar with him, so that we can say, man, I'm free. I can finally now not just wiggle, but I can live. And that's the good news. And we're almost ready to hear it. But first, we need to grasp this bad news or we'll always try to wiggle out of it. And that's what Paul's encouraging us this morning. Let's pray.